through that are mentioned in this book expository preaching by John MacArthur and we'll just note the headings and then I'll I'll just uh, Richard L. Mayhew um, just a few quotes about some things Re rediscovering expository preaching Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 Puritan commentator William Googe 1575-1653 minister there, therein to imitate God and to the best endeavour to instruct people in the mysteries of godliness and to teach them what to believe and practice and then to stir them up in act and deed and do what they are instructed to do their labour otherwise is likely to be in vain Neglect of this course is a main cause that men fall into as many errors as they do these days. Charles Spurgeon in 1834, about 19th century England, I may add that the last remark has gained more focus in our times. It is amongst uninstructed flocks that the wolves of popery make havoc. Sound teaching is the best protection from the heresies which ravage right and left among us. John Broders in 1827 decried the death of good preaching in America and Campbell J. Morgan 1863 noted to 1945 the supreme work of the Christian minister is the work of preaching this is a day in which one of our great perils is that of doing a thousand little things to the neglect of one thing which is preaching John MacArthur's review of preaching Specifically, evangelical preaching ought to reflect our conviction that God's word is infallible and inerrant. Too often it does not. In fact, there is a discernible trend in contemporary evangelicalism away from biblical preaching and a drift towards an experience-centered pragmatic topic approach in the pulpit. Biblical Mandates for Preaching Matthew chapter 28, 19, 20 Gold therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 1 Timothy 4.13 Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men, will be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Titus 2 1 But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. So, there's quite a lot of scripture there that gives the mandate for preaching so that's the biblical foundation and a few preachers there telling us about preaching and then so it, it, preaching is in the Bible the Bible teaches that we should preach so that's what's been proven there um, then just think about John MacArthur writes here about inerrancy in preaching Um, he notices the idea that there are no faults in the Bible J.R. Packer writes preaching appears in the Bible as relying, relaying of what God has said about himself and his doing and about men in relation to him plus oppressing of his commands promises, warnings and assurance with a view to winning the hearers or hearers to a positive repose ok Walter Kaiser, a great Old Testament scholar, wonderful scholar, says, It is no secret that Christ Church is not at all in good health in many places of the world. She has been languishing because she has been fed, as the current line has it, junk food, all kinds of artificial representatives, all sorts of unnatural substitutes have been served up to her. As a result, theological and biblical malnutrition has afflicted the very generation that has taken such 
giant steps to make sure its physical health is not damaged by using foods or products that are saccharogenic, otherwise harmful to their physical bodies. Simultaneously, a worldwide spiritual famine resulting from the absence of any genuine publication of the Word of God, Amos 8.11, continues to run wild, almost unabated in most quarters of the church. So, excuse me. So, inerrancy is important. If you don't believe the full inspiration of the Bible, then why preach on the Bible? You know, if this is not the Word of God, if this isn't inspired, then why preach on it? If you don't believe this book is fully inspired, then you shouldn't be preaching. Simple as that. If you haven't got confidence that this is the Word of God, you shouldn't be preaching. You don't be worried. Uh, just, just let me just. Uh, yeah, sorry. Don't be worried about the scholars of today and skeptics and all the rest of it. Don't be worried about them. Excuse me. Don't be worried about it. This is a, a, an important academic work, James Barr, Fundamentalism. He was an Oxford uh, scholar and uh, wrote uh, quite a bit critiquing evangelical views on the inspiration of the Bible. Basically, if you read what he says, and you reflect on what it says. And this is typical of these kind of scholars. It's straw man in evangelicalism and what but evangelicals believe about the Bible. Completely, he's more fundamentalist than the fundamentalist in his understanding of the Bible, the way he paints fundamentalists. He paints fundamentalists of having a wooden belief of inspiration, of worshipping the Bible above God. This is just complete straw manning stuff. And these kind of modern academics don't really understand the evangelical position. They caricature it. And there's been a long tradition in the academy since the Enlightenment to make fundamentalist evangelicals seem as if they are intellectual backwaters. Now, there are evangelicals who are not as engaged, who... who, 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 who who have not engaged with modern scholarship and, and, and are a bit anti-intellectual. But there have been many, many scholars, evangelical scholars throughout history, that have been well and truly engaged and well informed about what modern scholars are saying. I mean, take... Um, uh, I'll just read... Um, see if I can get it. Just get it. <coughs> see if I can get it. It's a really good. Uh, just see if I can find it. I don't know if it'll find it because it's so many articles in here, but. Uh, Yeah, R. Dick Wilson, 1925, Why I Believe the Old Testament is True, page 217. We've been fortunate, we're fortunate if you look at the history of, of, um, if you look at the history of, of, evangelical scholarship you go and look at the history and 
we've been fortunate to have some of the best scholars in the world in, in some certain areas. So, you know, we mustn't be intimidated by these kind of academics, by Barr and people like that. We've nothing to fear. Robert Dick Wilson says, Time would fail me to give all the reasons why I believe the Old Testament to be true. I have been given reasons for 30 years or more and I cannot sum up the results of 45 years of investigation in 45 minutes. Of course, I have had the ordinary reason for believing the Bible to be true. I still think that it gives the best philosophical explanation of the universe. It tells how God, the cause of all things, visible and invisible, for all ordained things for his glory and that he is surely bringing his purpose to pass. The Bible, when looked upon comparatively, stands out as the one great book of God known to the world today. We sometimes forget that the Bible itself is a fact in, in evidence. It is a work that as we have in our hands, however it may have come, we have it, and we can compare it with all the great philosophical works of the past and present and all the great religious works produced in all our countries, and I believe it is better than any of the rest. It justifies itself as God's book. In fact, it is the only book that pretends to be the book of God, the only book from beginning to end, as thus says the Lord. I am not going into subjective matters, though I love subjective matters. The philosophers of whom, according to the last history of philosophy I acquired, there were just about a thousand in Germany alone, think they have a, their little ha heads produced an explanation of the universe which is better than the word of God. The Lord... The Lord did not call me to be a philosopher. I never thought that I knew more than Jesus Christ. Talking to one of our philosophical, theological professors some time ago, I asked him this little question. This is the one of the greatest writers in America and one of the wisest men, at least in his own conceit, that we have in the whole states. I said, suppose we had statesmen, a statement in the New Testament which purported to have been made by Jesus Christ there was absolutely no doubt about the text. You knew that he said it, and you are certain that you understood exactly what the Lord meant. Would you believe it because the Lord said it? And the answer was, certainly not. Well, I said, that looks as if you were the Lord, not he, and he did not dispute that. I have never doubted that Jesus Christ knew more, even about his Old Testament, than I do. Further, I might expand that a little, for I have a little bit of egotism in me. Indeed, I have so much egotism that I'm not going to give the conduct of my soul into the hands of any man, though he be a professor or even the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Pope. My soul is too big for any mere man to direct, but I will take God, and if Jesus Christ is God, as I believe, I am willing to submit my soul for time and eternity into his keeping. Let me give up the Bible, and I will make my own philosophy. I will say, like the old Epicureans, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That is the matter that with the world today which has given up its Christ. I do not believe any man today without revelations knows anything more about God than Plato did. I have come some deceit, but I have never had enough to buck up against Plato. I always thought Plato was better at philosophy than anything I could possibly be. An old professor at Berlin used to tell us boys there in the university that all the philosophers since have not produced anything equal to Plato, so that if I wanted to philosophy, I suppose I might go to Plato. But while he said that, he believed in God. He added that if we were to know anything about him, he himself must send a messenger to teach us. I do not believe we have any right to call these man-made systems theology. They are anthropology. I do not want their anthropology. I will make my anthropology for myself. There is only one theology, and it is God and God-given. Now, I might give an account of, many, of the many investigations I have mean, made. The reason I became a specialist was because I, wanted, I was not satisfied with the old defences, especially of the book of Daniel. And I thought that it would be a worthy labour if somebody could devote his life to the preparation necessary for the defence of the Old Testament. Philology, pelographically, 
and historically against all comers. And according to the principle of law, which required that a man who is called upon as an expert should first show his right to speak as an expert, I would say to this audience that at any rate I have made a good and strenuous attempt to prepare myself to speak. After I had become able to read about a dozen languages and had taught about eight of them and had been instructor in theological school for a year, I started across the water to prepare myself to give my life to the defence of the Old Testament. I came over to Oxford and saw Professor Sace, was then a young man. He advised me to go to Germany and I went and instead of just hearing lectures from the professors giving the results of their labours I made a plan like this. I was then 25 and I laid out a plan for 45 years work. The first 15 years of the time I determined to give to the acquisition of the language necessary enabled to me to read the ancient documents which alone give first-hand information with regard to Old Testament history. Those languages are Hebrew and all the cognate languages. Secondly, all languages into which the Old Testament was translated up to the year 600 after Christ. And thirdly, such languages as Egyptian and Persian which would throw light upon Old Testament history. The second 15 years of my plan were to be devoted to the study of the text of the Old Testament. The third 15 years I was given going to give up to the higher criticism. One of your professors from England who was in America some years ago said that every man ought to be asphyxiated when he was 45 years of age. I just changed that a little and said that any man who attempts to write anything upon higher criticism of the Old Testament before he is 45 years of age ought to be asphyxiated. Why? Because he does not know enough to write upon such a subject. I studied at the Berlin University of Berlin and then went back to America to be a professor. The Lord has given me a chance to carry out that plan for that day onwards and I am now in my 45th year of the fulfilment of that plan. During the first 15 years I devoted myself to the languages. In that time I can get a working knowledge of the languages if he keeps at it. The second period I studied the Old Testament text, studying every letter in the Old Testament in Hebrew, comparing it with all the ancient versions and making notes. I knew nothing and know nothing yet about Old Testament text or Babylonian or Egyptian or any other ancient documents except what I get by hard work and the first-hand investigation of the documents themselves. A short time ago a young professor brought out a book about the Old Testament. He said in the introduction, I have not an idea of my own in this book, which was true. The only idea was the way in which he made this book. It consisted in the gathering together of all the opinions of all the men who thought like himself. At the end he had 15 pages of what he called authorities, and every one of those authorities was a radical critic except one. That one was his predecessor in the chair he then occupied, and for the politeness sake he had put him in. That professor never cited the Old Testament text as an authority. He cited nothing but other writers and often you will have to go through eight or ten of those writers before you get to any original statement by anybody. I count none of these men an authority for me. The Old Testament itself is the only authority and we can trace it back step by step through the present Hebrew MS in existence. So, he studied all these languages. He studied all these languages. Hello? What are you doing? Hey? What are you doing? Yeah, yes. Yeah. You all right? Are you all right? Yeah. What's happening? Mike's coming off. Why? There's no Bible study, so he's coming for a prayer. You don't bother, you can stay here. Okay. You alright? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I've just been talking about preaching and preachers. Alright. Sorry about this. So, inerrancy is important 
people like Robert Dick Wilson he's as you can see he was an awesome scholar absolutely awesome uh, forgive me for having a cup of tea and I know it's a bit rude but I hope you don't mind it's an absolute necessity that when you get in that pulpit when you're preaching that word that you have confidence that it's the word of God it's no good getting into the pulpit and having a doubt about the word of God so so you need to work on those doubts from time to time in the ministry when you're preaching you will get doubts if you're intellectually honest even the best of preachers will get doubts but it's how you deal with the doubts a lot of people forgive me for saying a proverbial throw the baby out with the bath water you get a student at seminary and they'll read a book and they'll see or they'll read a, a professor or some student at university uh, who's a Christian they'll they'll go to university and they'll hear a professor talk about something and a lot of these seminary professors a lot of these university professors they're there to upset especially if you're a Christian they're there to pull your faith down they're there to pull you to, to uh, challenge you um, their cry will be they're trying to get you to think they're not trying to get you to think there's no neutrality in the academic world you just got to get that in your head there is no neutrality in the academic world there is only darkness and light I proved this beyond a shadow of a doubt I went to a seminary I went to two seminaries an evangelical seminary and then a liberal seminary I went to the liberal seminary but the evangelical one was pretty liberal but I went to the mainline liberal seminary and I went there to see what the other side said and did and I went open-minded to hear what they had to say and we had gay lecturers, lesbian lecturers, and all the rest of it in theology and, and stuff, and gay students and all the rest of it. And I tell you this, there was no neutrality. Because as soon as they knew that I believed in the Word of God, as soon as they knew about that I believed he was, Christ was the only way and whatever, they made it pretty difficult for me at times. They made it pretty difficult for me at times. And they would only play with me if I played their game so there is no neutrality in the academic world all right the academic world whether in seminary or in university or wherever they're out to pull your faith down they'll tell you they're trying to get you to think but they're not trying to get you to think everything that you'll be reading or whatever is there to pull your faith down unless you've got a strong faith to process it work it through it's going to destroy you but as a minister or, or as a Christian you're going to get times where whether you go to seminary or whether you go to university or whether you've seen something on the news or whatever you're going to get some situation where your faith is challenged and so what do you do a lot of young people even ministers will make shipwreck of their faith because they can't answer one question or two questions and then they, they their faith collapses that that's that's just madness it's a madness and it's madness because if you've got evidence for most of your faith but someone brings up a question that you can't answer or it's a difficult problem you don't throw everything away it's, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like here I've got a pie okay it's a pork pie and somebody's just brought brought it to me yeah and for some reason there's a little bit I don't know how it got say but a little bit of pen hink on that bit there because of that little bit of pen hink I throw the whole pie away 
when all I have to do is just take that little bit and just get on eating the rest. What now? Mmm. It's good. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Pork pie is gorgeous. So. Sorry. So, don't collapse just because you can't answer a few questions. Go to people who can answer them for you. Uh, in the area of Old Testament and why did God allow the murders and all the rest of it, Peter Williams, uh, type in Peter Williams, he's a very good scholar. There's a good discussion uh, at uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary by Al Muller and some scholars about that. Go and have a listen to what they say. Um, sorry. And um, on the issue of, of murders and everything like that, and, and God killing all the Canaanites and everything, number one, they had 450 years to repent, because God tells Abraham... Set, you're going to, they're going to be sent in the promised land I'm giving time for these people to repent and um, it, at the end of the day there's going to be a judgment day where everyone's going to be who doesn't believe sent to hell so what happened in the Old Testament is a kind of picture of what's going to happen in, in, in on judgment day you know that the earthly Israel is a shadow, is a faint reflection of what's going to happen uh, of heaven, and um, so these judgments that happened in the Old Testament that seem ferocious, and you think, whoa, what's going on here? This seems really, really bad. Well, at the end of the day, it's in the context that God is in control, and God will do His judging. If God wants to take a nation out, if He wants to take five million little kids out he can do it there is people and he can do that and if you want to call it barbaric well you when you meet god on judgment day you won't be calling god barbaric because you'll be going into hell if you don't believe in him at the end of the day let god be god if god exists let him it's up to him what he does sorry I know this is very rude, I'm sorry. But I have been talking for two hours. Uh, on the ter terms of uh, creation and evolution, um, there's been a lot of conspiracies against Christians on that. There has been, if you go and look at Expelled, which got panned by atheists and all sorts, you go and look at the documentary called Expelled, and there are, and you go follow some of the scholars in there, who not who weren't Christian, and who got persecuted to try and encourage discussion on tel intelligent design. I've gone and investigated the documents myself, and you'll find that the academic world has tried to stop intelligent design research. So there is a conspiracy out there. Even Dawkins, there was a guy, a journalist who did. A book on exposing evolution and he was a bit of a, a wacko evil uh, journalist picking strange subjects and he picked on this evolution thing and he wanted to expose it and he actually brought some really good points up and the art and he really did do some good research this journalist I mean he really did he was a bit wacky sometimes he picked like did books on other like wacky subjects, but he did, he actually did some pretty powerful research. And uh, there was a newspaper that wanted to publish, or an academic journal, and Dawkins had it stopped. So these people, these academics on evolution and all this, said that the the science is biased there's no two ways about it and uh, you, you know if you buy into this 
stuff that the evolutionists uh, these objective scientists then you you're a fool because it's not the case then the second thing is is the evolutionist will come up with all they can bamboozle you they'll bamboozle you with all this science about retroviruses and all the rest of it and they'll have your head spinning but it's dead simple prove the mechanism of evolution and natural selection uh, natural selection and mutation prove that mecha mechanism provides new species what you'll get is what do you mean by new species what do you mean by this what do you mean by that they'll bog you down with asking definitions what do you mean by this what do you mean by that you say well just give us some evidence for natural selection and mutations producing new species well what do you mean by new species and they'll bog you down oh and what about retroviruses what about tree lines shows the world is old and all the rest of it no 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 just give me evidence for the mechanism of natural selection and mutations and guess what folks there ain't no evidence why because it happens over billions of years so they can't actually demonstrate it in a lab so it they claim they're scientific where they can demonstrate things in a lab but they can't demonstrate that process because it takes billions of years so that means evolution is not even falsifiable and if it's going to be science it needs someone to be able to come and possibly falsify it but how can you falsify something that you can't even examine you can't examine the process of evolution in the sense of billions of years because it takes billions of years so you can't even falsify it so they can go on about retroviruses and they can go on and bamboozle you with all the uh, talk about genetics and all the rest but at the end of the day there's no evidence for it because all the evidence that they're producing is influenced by the theory that they've not proved but that they said they proved and they haven't proved it and it's just simple one-on-one -on -one science if you're going to be a scientist do science in a proper way and the evolutionists aren't doing science in a proper way they might think they're doing science in a proper way but they're not they're doing historical science and that's by Mayer one of the world's authorities on evolution who's not an evolutionist has stated that evolution is a historical science and if it's a historical science it means it's about interpretation of history looking back at history well if it's about looking back at history and the interpretation of history well my interpretation of history of Jesus in being the Son of God in the year of the first in the first 30 years of the first century AD that historical science is more solid and well established than a historical science that is based over billions of years because if you know that it's how difficult it is to to give evidence for a historical fact of say 90 years ago or 100 years ago or 800 years ago and you know how that's difficult that is to then go on and say you know exactly what's took place four three billion years ago is nonsense absolute nonsense and how anybody can follow evolution to my mind is is, is bonkers and they can they can say what they want they can say that they know all about science and they've got all the scholarship and science has proved it but if you buy into it you're not buying into science you're buying into the the rhetoric that they have given and you've bought into that rhetoric that science knows what it's talking about and it's this idea about science and it's a it's a philosophy it's not science this idea that science is solved about evolution let me just tell you something if you look at all the history of cultures every culture has had to have a view of origins and here's the point every culture has to have a view of where it came from for those who are in power those who want to control those who want to have a cultural project they have to have a view of origins right because the where they came from is the foundation for the rhetoric of the cultural project so if you look at the Egyptians they had a view of origins 
and their view of origins was the foundation of the pharaoh's cultural project to get the egyptian people to do what they want you look at the babylonian culture they had a, a view of origins and it was that view of origins that led the babylonian kings to do get the people to do what they want moses had a view of origins and that was his method of leading the people out of egypt into canaan right Modern culture since the, the Enlightenment needed a view of origins with all the knowledge that they were gaining and they wanted a, a way to justify the separation for, of church and state and to give their newfound knowledge and imperialism a kind of foundation. Because don't forget in the Enlightenment was a period of colonialization where nations like Germany and Britain and the rest were going around taking control of Africa and countries like that yeah so in the enlightenment culture needed a view of origins and the idea that we came from slime and that we developed as apes and that we became human beings fitted that cultural agenda of expansionism colonial expansionism that we were now growing up and being better people that we had come from the ashes that we now can take control of our future and if you don't believe me that that was a cultural issue, if you look at um, Huxley in the time of Darwin, he specifically said to Darwin that you need to get this published, and he was talking about the political challenges in earth shaking uh, scenario that would have on Victorian British culture. And if you look at the history of evolution from Darwin right up into the 1960s, Evolution was central, a central plank in those who were the cultural elites who wanted to change the sexual and cultural way of doing things. And that was used as the, the rod to, to achieve those purposes. So it's a case of which, so, so that's just the basic fact about origins. And it's not about science it's about power it's about power and control concerning origin so now you're going to say well you're deconstructing yourself jay because you're saying that but you also included moses and and uh, the creation of Cain. but here's the point there i'm just telling you the facts of history that evolution if you're not about science it's about the fact that you look at any civilization, they need a view of origins to survive and to do their cultural project. It's not about science. And so, one cultural, one view of origins was accepted for the cultural project of what that group wanted to achieve. So it comes down to when you read the text of the Old Testament and you read the text of Moses whether you believe that that is of God or not that the cultural project that Moses had of leading the people of through the promised land and the cultural project uh, and, and the and the revelation of the God of this creation account whether that makes sense to you and whether that comes across as true and so therefore when you think about that then you can compare it with the evolutionary cultural project and see that that is a pure cultural project where the Moses and the the Genesis account is not just a cultural project but is the truth so what am I saying well basically I know I'm going on a bit I'm just saying that if you look at history every civilization has a cultural project and needs a view of origins to sustain itself and only one of those views can be right it only one of them can be the true true origins and I would say that the Moses account is a better explanation of reality than the evolutionary account right off the bat the evolutionary account means that something came from nothing 
So right off the bat, it, 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 it doesn't make sense. The Christian account is that there was a God who made everything. That makes more sense than to say that matter just came from nothing. The whole of creation shows a designer, the whole of creation shows beauty, it shows interconnection, it shows uh, continuity. All these things cannot have come by pure chance, it can only come from a designer. So the creation account makes more sense. The creation account talks about the fall of man. It explains why man has been in a mess since that time better than the evolutionary model which is contradictory and doesn't have the, the facts that, that it, it supposedly has so I would say that the creation account of Genesis is the true account of origins because we're seeing a God who's not only leading the people of Genesis, Genesis out uh, sorry the people of of the Israelites out of of Egypt but God comes down in human flesh and dies and so it's not just about power it's about sacrifice that this God came and gave his life for us whereas all the other cultural symbols of origins are pure power pure control pure manipulation the intellectuals and the cultural elites since Darwin the present time have used the origin of evolution to control eugenics in the 1920s and 30s where uh, people where the government of the United States using evolution saying that we, we can't have people uh, marrying mentally ill people or uh, mentally retarded people and uh, that was all and so they were engineering it making sure that people um, were healthy if they were going to have children and things like that uh, and so they m manipulated birth rates in America down to evolution the the 1940s Hitler uh, there was an, a number of documentaries made by the Third Reich on uh, the supremacy of the Aryan race and about the cultural project of Nazism and at the very heart of it was the rhetoric of evolution the very heart of it was Darwin in Darwin's thesis and it was there in the early documentaries and that led to the killing of Jewish people and the cultural project of Nazism uh, and that was a direct result from the language of evolution and the documentaries are there to prove it, you only have to go to the archives and look it into it. So uh, you, you can see it in the textbooks of evolutionists. Uh, many of the evolutionary issues that they brought up were have been debunked, yet they were kept in the textbooks. Um, the illustration of the moths and how the moths were changing colour and things like that and proving that uh, different species can develop uh, was proved to be wrong because at the end of the day moths are still moths they've not changed into anything else and they've been debunked and yet they were still kept in debunked by evolutionary science, scientists and yet they're still kept in textbooks they were still kept in textbooks at the time uh, fooling people why was that? because there was an agenda that's in um, uh, icons of e evolution um, if you type in icons of evolution uh, what's the scholar sorry about this um, Jonathan Wells, that's it, Icons of Evolution. Jonathan Wells. Um, so, inerrancy is important. We've just touched on evolution, and uh, we've touched on um, the Old Testament. 
But there's been a revival in philosophy. Uh, I don't agree with everything of Alvin Plantinga, but he uh, there's a lot of philosophers that have been Christian and they've changed the philosophical world the last 30 years in the academic world. Uh, so Christian philosophy is really strong now. Uh, in historical Jesus studies, uh, we have some of the most brilliant scholars. I know I've critiqued uh, N.T. Wright, but there is he and other scholars uh, have done some... Uh, important work in historical Jesus studies and uh, evangelicals are leaders in this area um, as well so there's nothing to fear um, books on inerrance uh, contradictions in the Bible you can find good books on that there's uh, Poitras on John Frame's uh, website really good book um, on inerrancy and the Gospels shows the so-called contradictions in the Gospels and works it through for you really really good book and there's a couple of good books on logic and other topics on John Frame's website that you can download for free so you've nothing to free fear either philosophically scientifically exegetically from scholars that sometimes it'll be difficult but you've got to hold on to it and say if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God as a preacher you've lost it you're just going to be sounding out your own opinions, your own ideas. This guy, uh, Karl Barth, neo-orthodox scholar, waffled on about how he believed the Bible was the Word of God, but he did not believe in inerr inerrancy, and he wrote over 11 theology books of dogmatics, church dogmatics, and he did not believe in inerrancy. Okay? So, people have been intimidated by people like this because they wrote 11 books on theology, so what? If you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, as a preacher, you've lost it. You've just lost it and you shouldn't be preaching. It's as simple as that. Uh, that's Karl Barth's book on homiletics. It's the worst book I've ever read on homiletics in my life. Absolutely disgraceful. It's dead. It's boring. It's got nothing to get of any merit in it whatsoever. The last chapter of that book is worth its weight in gold. Okay. Lord John's sermons is eight, eight volumes in Ephesians and his eight volumes in or ten volumes in Romans is a billion times better than anything this guy's ever wrote and yet he's seen as more important in the academic world So we've covered inerrancy really, I think. We've covered inerrancy. I'm sorry about drinking from my tea and eating my pork pie. I'm sorry about that. Look at the fruits of liberalism. What does liberalism what does it what does it achieve when people don't believe this? When they start believing in evolution, when they start questioning the Old Testament, when they start what does it actually achieve? What's the fruit? The fruit is devastation. Churches lose their impact. Lose their impact. Here's uh, what Campbell J. Morgan says about his struggle to know the Word of God. He was a preacher. So we've looked at inerrancy in this video. Here is the account of young Campbell Morgan's struggle to know if the Bible was surely God's word. For three years this young man, seriously contemplating a future of teaching and ultimately of preaching, felt the troubled waters of the stream of religious controversy carrying him beyond his depth. He read the new books which debated such questions as, Is God Knowable? and found that the author's concerted decision was, He is not knowable. He became fused and confused and perplexed. No longer was he sure of what his father proclaimed in public, 
that taught him in the home. Other books appeared seeking to defend the Bible from that attacks which were being made upon it. The more he read, the more unanswerable became the questions which filled his mind. One who has never suffered it, it cannot appreciate the anguish of spirit young Campbell Morgan endured during this crucial period of his life. Through all the after years, it gave him the greatest sympathy with young people passing through similar experiences at college, experiences which he liked to passing through a trackless desert. At last the crisis came when he admitted to himself his total lack of assurance that the Bible was the authoritative word of God to man. He immediately cancelled all preaching engagements, then taking all his books, both those attacking and those defending the Bible, he put them all in a corner cupboard. Relating this afterwards, as he did many times in preaching, he, he told of turning the key in the lock of the door, I can hear the click of that lock now, he used to say. He went out of the house and down the street to a bookshop. He bought a new Bible and returning to his room with it, he said to himself, I am no longer sure that this is what my father claims to be, the word of God. But if this I am sure, if it be the word of God, and if I have come to it with an unprejudiced and open mind, it will bring assurance to my soul of itself. That Bible found me, he said. I began to read and study it then, in 1883, and I have been a student ever since, and I still am in 1938. At the end of the two years, Campbell Morgan emerged from that eclipse of faith absolutely sure that the Bible was in, ver in very deed and truth none other than the word of the living God. Quoting again from his account of the incident, this experience is what at last took me back into the work of preaching and into the work of the ministry. I soon found foothold enough to begin to preach and from that I went on. What this crisis behind him with this crisis behind him and this new certainty thrilling his soul became a compelling conviction. This book, being what it was, merited all that man could give to its study, not merely for the sake of personal joy of delving deeply into the heart and mind and will of God, but also in order that those truths discovered by such searching of the scriptures should be made known to a world of men groping for light and perishing in the darkness with no clear knowledge of his will. So, we're getting to, uh, so we'll mention uh, some more stuff in the next video. I think we'll finish on this one, and then, whoops. And uh, we'll, ha we'll make a, uh, one more so really we what we've looked at today we've looked at in inerrancy and we've talked about the importance of believing the word of God uh, the scriptural mandate for inerrancy all you got to do is just do an outline or well you can turn to uh, Psalm 119 Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with his whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his way. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Not pick and mix. Oh, I like that bit in the Bible. I don't like that bit in the Bible. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. So he wants to keep the statutes of God. He doesn't go... All that my wares would pick and mix. All that my wares would make up my religion. No, no. He wants to follow the living God. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart. When I shall have learned thy righteous judgments, I will keep thy statutes, or forsake me not utterly. Wherein shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed therein according to thy word with my whole heart. Have I sought thee, or let me not wander from my commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. 
I will delight myself in the statues. I will not forget thy word. Deal bountifully with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of the law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all time. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove me from reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statues. Thy testimonies are my delight and my counsellors. My soul cleaveth unto the dust, quickeneth thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways, in thou, and thou heardest me, teaching my statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness, strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth, thy judgments have I laid before thee. I have struck, stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of the commandments where thou shalt enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I will keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I will keep thy law. Ye, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covenantness. And it's all about the word of God. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation, according to thy word. Not according to my word. Not according to public opinion, not according to scholarship, not according to feminism or whatever ism is out there, but according to thy word. He's following his word. So shall I wherein to answer him that reproacheth, for I trust in thy word, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in judgment. And you need to trust the word of God and believe in the word of God. Now, I just a little word for those at seminary or, or at university when you study you. Sorry. Those at seminary and at university who are studying. When you're involved in study, your mind gets tired. You get, you, you, when you're at work in a seminary or you're at work in, in, um, at university, your brain is continually working continually grinding facts and information and your brain spiritually can't function the way it used to do because you're so busy writing essays and so busy studying so when so when you're reading books that are not sound books that question and challenge your faith at university or college or at seminary you, you're very often not able to process it because your brain is tired, your brain has to deal with so much information. And so that's a time of wilderness time where you feel your faith is shaken. You feel you haven't got the answers to these questions. You feel that maybe your faith is just a lie. Maybe it is a delusion. And you're very, very weak and vulnerable in that situation. And it can last for a year, three years, four years, however long your studying period. And maybe a couple of years, if not a few years, after you've studied and it can be a very difficult process to go through. In that time, what can help you is have someone you can go to who's a mature believer. You can meet up every now and again to talk and read scripture. Number two, may try and get to a church, either at the university or seminary or wherever. But go to a church once a week. I know it's hard to do so when you're studying. But that will help you more than anything because the simple preached word of God will counteract some of these ideas that you've been getting. They'll help you. God will speak to you. If you're a believer and the Holy Spirit's in you, the Holy Spirit, when the word is being preached, will be confirmed to you and will be sealed in your heart. And even though you've got all these doubts and you think the word of God has been proved wrong and all the rest, the Holy Spirit will seal the word of God to your heart 
and you'll feel warm in your in your heart and you'll know that the word of god is truth and even god will answer some of the questions that you've had okay try and read some good christian books that will help you but it's going to be difficult if you've got to deal with all the skeptical work at college but when you get time whether at college or after college or in the summer a good place to go to work out your intellectual problems is Labrie Fellowship. There is a fellowship in down south in the UK and there's a couple of fellowships in America and around the world. Now basically they were started by Francis Schaeffer. He got a log cabin in the 50s and 60s and students came in Switzerland to these log cabins to discuss their intellectual questions. And now there are these communities like log cabin communities of academics that stay there live there that are professional university academics and that you can go and study with them work in the summer for a few weeks or a few months and then you can get to know the people talk to them and they will encourage you and help you if you can get to Libri fellowship for a summer that will help you and get on their website and you can download some of their lectures and talks that will really really help you uh, the other place to study uh, in summer maybe you could do a course is um, Ravi Zachariah in London uh, in Oxford summer school and also um, Co New uh, Covenant Theological Seminary um, you could study there maybe do a course online um, and, and that could help you okay read the books of Francis Schaeffer uh, read Greg Banson's essays in apologetics and look at his lectures they're very helpful I don't agree with everything Greg Banson he wasn't perfect I don't agree with his reconstructionism but he was excellent in uh, basic apologetics his uh, his course on um, that you can watch on YouTube on um, defending the Christian faith is absolutely phenomenal and his debate with Stein uh, an atheist is a model in how to debate and discuss with atheists um, if you want to deal with other religions Islam answering Islam is a good website um, if you want to know about the minimal fact approach Gary Habermas's website and Mike Leclona's website are very helpful in getting information how to debate on the resurrection and answer questions there uh, I don't agree with the views on theistic evolution and uh, Lycona's weakness on inerrancy but they have, have given some good historical arguments for the resurrection of Christ which is really good uh, go on to Legionnaire Ministries where you can download apologetic material by R.C. Sproul uh, you can get free books uh, to help you on pastoral issues that you might be struggling with like why does God allow suffering on Desiring God Ministries free books can be downloaded there by John Piper um, cultural issues about gay marriage and all the rest of it the best commentator on all that from an evangelical perspective is Al Muller if you go to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, he's the president. Find out about him there. He has a website where he writes articles. Uh, New Testament scholarship, Don Carson, is very helpful. Um, that's it, really. That's all about inerrancy. Apologetics 313, I think it is will give you a whole host of different stuff that you can go and listen to uh, you can read Alvin Plantinga's papers on philosophy and religion that's helpful uh, on skeptical issues uh, debunking atheism um, John Lennox's book on uh, the new atheism I don't agree with John Lennox's theistic evolution but he has written a very very good book on criti criticizing new atheism uh, if you want to read that book that will help you immensely in dealing with any atheist that you might come across um, William Lane Craig's uh, channel is very helpful uh, a book that is brought out on with JP Morland on 
theology and philosophy is very helpful. Uh, don't agree with his theistic evolution, but he's done some good lectures uh, critiquing Bart Ehrman. Uh, James White has done some good debates and good lectures on Bart Ehrman. I don't fully agree with everything James White says. Um, the Unbelievable Radio Program has done some good discussions on apologetics with scholars from against and, and for um, bethinking.org is a website run by the student union in the UK it's got some very good academic articles and cultural articles um, so th that's just about inerrancy really um, classic articles on inerrancy if you go on monogism a reformed website you'll find loads of stuff uh, on the uh, articles on just find the book part and section um, gospel coalition will have many courses and lectures on inerrancy uh, also um, if you go uh, on sermon index you will see the fruit of inerrancy. You'll see many preachers on Sermon Index, either on YouTube or or on the website. And you'll see the fruit of what it is to believe inerrancy. You'll see preachers preach in a way that you will not see liberal preachers preach. And you'll see the difference between an inerrancist and a non-inerrancist. Uh, a good book to read is uh, Gresham Machen's Christianity and Liberalism, which you can download PDF, is a really good book to read about inerrancy. There's a chapter on the in the Bible. B.B. Warfield's written some sorts articles about inerrancy. Uh, Princeton theologian and um, a famous book by J.I. Packer called Fundamentalism and the Word of God is a good book that you could read. That could be a help. Uh, there is a book by I think Archer uh, answering Bible difficulties uh, that you can get PDF which answers like many of the of the contradictions in the Bible. Answering Islam, if you go on to answering Islam, uh, you'll find scholars there because a lot of Muslims will crit criticize the Bible. You find lots of good scholarship there defending. The inspiration of the Bible. Um, I'm just trying to think. So I think that'll do. I think you've got enough there. So preaching and preachers. This video we've looked about inerrancy really. We've we've just thought about some of the questions about the Old Testament evolution and stuff like that and we talked about why inerrancy is important why it's vital um, and uh, we've read a few scriptures from Psalm 119 to show you that it's about what the word says not your opinion We've thought, we've thought about the devastation of what it is if you don't believe the Bible. It'll just ruin your own faith. We've talked about the pastoral issues of if you're at university or seminary. But even as a Christian, uh, you know, there are a lot of missionary skeptics out there now trying to deconvert you, trying to get you to move away from your Christian faith. All I can say is if you're a Christian, they can't deconvert you. If you're a real Christian, you will know God, and you will you'll be equipped in some way to discern that they are not teaching the truth. So, if you're not really converted, they'll get you these people anyway. But if you're a real Christian, they won't be able to take you away from the faith because the Holy Spirit will give you discernment to know that what they're saying is not truth. But if they do come to you, the any whether it be a Muslim or an atheist, militant atheist, and they they will they will have a every person 
who tries to pull you away from your faith, whether it be a, a Jehovah's Witness, a Muslim, a Mormon or a witness, they will have a system, whatever that system is. And if you're not equipped to deal with that system, they'll pull you down. If it's a Mormon, a Muslim, a Jew, uh, not sorry, a Mormon, Muslim, atheist, Muslim, uh, Jehovah's Witness, they'll have a system. And if you're not equipped to know what that system is and how to deal with it, they will pull you down, they will weaken your faith. So, the best way to deal with them is to know this, is to read this daily, to study it daily, get equipped in it. That's the first thing. Study this daily, read it daily, so that when Muslims or atheists or Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons come to you, if you know this, you, you're well equipped. I've read philosophy books, I've read theology books, I've read all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, you, you, this is the main thing. If you know this, you're protected. So you get to know this. This is your sword of the Lord. And then secondly, do courses and study to make yourself approved, even as a Christian. Do a course on Islam. Download a few free books that you can read, Christian book, apologetic books. Don't get too heavily involved in it. Don't get too bogged down in it. Uh, do a course studying the Bible and seeing how you can answer the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Listen to a few debates. Listen to a few discussions. Get some training and talk to your pastor or talk to leaders that can help you to recommend books to you uh, they'll, they'll be really encouraged to guide you and encourage you uh, have a word with your pastor say pastor could we have a, a seminar on the Jehovah's Witnesses or a seminar on Islam or a seminar I just feel I need to be equipped could you equip us you know and they'll and the pastor if it's a good pastor he'll try and do his best to, to equip you um, so those are the things that I would encourage you to do. Get equipped, you know, um, work and, and, and don't get too bogged down with it. Don't get too bogged down with apologetics because you can just get too, too in your head. But you just need to know a little bit so that you can defend your faith and also that you're not troubled by every wind of doctrine, that you're settled in your faith. And I think that's where knowing good biblical truth helps. So listen to the sermons of Lloyd Jones, listen to the sermons of Piper, of John MacArthur, listen to the sermon index sermons of George Verwer and the old preachers that you can get on sermon index. Listen to good biblical preaching. And that will give you a solidity, so you're not moved and pushed around by every wind of doctrine. But if you're going to be a preacher, if you're going to be a preacher, you better believe this. Because if you don't believe this, you should not be preaching. Alright? If you don't believe this is the word of God, please leave the ministry please pack it in unless someone who believes this preach okay of those who are preaching the word of god never surrender never compromise never surrender to a bishop a priest or an academic who doubts this word never ever surrender you say that this is the word of God and you preach as the word of God and if they want to laugh and mock let them laugh and mock if they want to take away your job let them take away your job but never ever compromise the word of God you are not at liberty to do that as a preacher you must not compromise you must stand and stand for the word of God and that means you need to prepare yourself as a preacher the great preachers were always great readers. So 
Spurgeon had thousands of books in his library. Lloyd-Jones, when he was on holiday and his kids were playing on the beach, he was sat there with his hat on in the, in the weather, hot weather, reading M. L. Bruner, The Divine Mediator, which is, uh, or The Divine Imperative, or, or whatever, uh, which is a massive work. Neo-Orthodox, he wasn't Neo-Orthodox, he was Orthodox sound. But he was on holiday reading theology. The Puritans were great readers. The early church fathers were great readers. All the great men of God, Augustine, Ambrose, you name it, they were all great readers. Say Chrysostom. They were all great readers. Because if you're going to give out, you've got to take in. But if you're going to answer the heretics, if you're going to answer the false teaching, if you're going to shepherd the flock, you need to know what the wolves are saying. You need to know what the wolves' arguments are. So that when you're teaching the word of God, you can answer the wolves by the word of God and inform your sheep. And give them tips how they can answer the Jehovah's Witnesses and whatever. But again, don't be too over intellectual. Always make sure you're basing it on the word and the Holy Spirit. But as a preacher, you need to be equipped. You need to study. You need to read widely. You need to read what's happening in the world. You need to read about what others are saying. You need to read um, all the different views that are around today that are critiquing the Bible, that are critiquing Christianity. You need to read them. And you need to think through their issues and you need to be able to answer them from the Word of God. So when you're preaching and someone in your congregation comes up to you and says, I enjoyed your message, it was a real blessing, but I've got problems about this, I've got problems about that. You say, well, okay. And they'll say, oh, uh, I was in the bookshop the other day and I saw this book, Misquoting Jesus by Bar Ehrman, and I bought it and I've been profoundly shocked, Pastor, and I'm worried that it's just really blown my faith and you were preaching on the Bible's the word of God and you can turn around and say oh misquoting Jesus I've read that I can tell you what's the strengths and weaknesses of that book and you can answer them and, and help them and the next sermon that you do you can just bring in a little bit of some facts or something that just might help people to realise that they mustn't worry about that kind of book yeah inerrancy is vital it, it, it's the first Bulwark, that goes, you've got nothing. So we've had a whole session on it. A whole session on the inerrancy of the Word of God. You, haven't, you don't believe this is inspired? The battle's lost before you even begin. And I want to say to you cultural preachers out there, who uh, all these uh, trendy preachers and pastors, or emotional preachers and pastors, or whatever, Philosophical preachers and pastors, philosophical ones who are using logic rather than the Word of God, the experiential ones who are just full of experience, not following the Word of God, the trendy ones who are using culture, not the Word of God. I want to say to all you people who are saying this bit's inspired, that's not inspired. All you're doing is destroying the church. You're wreaking havoc and confusion. And you need to repent. And you need to trust the Lord. And you need to do a great work for God. And turn back the damage that you've been doing. And if you don't, God will bring judgment upon you. And he'll bring judgment on your churches and on your people and on your denomination. And in a hundred years time you'll be forgotten. But the preachers nearby, the preachers round the corner, the preachers not far away from you who, who are not as trendy as you, not as logical as you and or not as full of zeal for whatever you're doing they'll be having fruit they'll be disciples following the Jesus built on the foundation of the Word of God serving the Lord while your legacy would have been decimated that's what happens to liberalism 
in all its forms. Pick and mix theology is poison, it leads nowhere, and it's disastrous. And you need to pack it in and leave it. You're not smart. You're not as smart as God. You're not as clever as God. You're not as logical as God. You don't know more experience than God. You're not God. He's God. And if he's God, the word is God. And if the word is God, you're a man or you're a woman. You're finite. So stop thinking you're God. Stop thinking that you're cleverer than God. Stop thinking that you're smarter than God. Stop making your own morality up, your own religion up. And that, but passing it off to the congregations as if it's Christianity. It's not Christianity. It's just your Christianity. Your version of it. Your perverted version of it. That's all it is. You might have a nice little ministry, a nice little chapel, and a nice, nice little manse, nice little salary, and everything might be nice. And you tell people, oh, this isn't inspired, that's not inspired, you can do this immoral thing or that immoral thing. Because we've grown up now, we've grown more than the Bible. You can tell them all that. But God's judgment is on you and your church. Make no mistake about it. God's judgment is on you. And he's on your church. And God's leaving you in your nice little life. Your nice little cultural smarmy life where you think you're clever and smart. With your nice clever little congregation. He's leaving you there. With your nice little life. Enjoying your nice little cultural agenda. Telling people the Bible's not inspired. Or pretending it's inspired but sugarcoating it with weaky milk. With weak fake theology. That's really your theology that you've got through a few feminist books or a, a few whatever trendy theology books are around today. But the cancer of the devastating spiritual cancer that you brought into your church, God will leave you to it. And in years to come, the fruit of your labours will be revealed. Now that fruit will be exactly nothing. Because God's glory is not on it. His blessing is not on it. And it won't go anywhere. And it might have the praise of men. But it has the stink of death with God. And your congregation will close down. Your church will close down. And it will be turned into a supermarket. Or be turned into a mosque in generations to come. While there be churches not far away that have been flourishing and planted other churches because they were grounded in the word of God and they discipled people in the word of God and they uttered not one criticism of this but believed and upholded it as the word of God. By their fruits you shall know them. And the fruit of li liberalism is no fruit at all. So, where are the Gnostics today? In the time of Irenaeus, where are the Gnostics? They're gone. Where are the Orthodox? Those who come after uh, Irenaeus, they're here in their millions, all over the world, preaching the Word of God. That's the fruit of Orthodoxy. Because it's the fruit of truth, it's the fruit of Christ, it's the fruit of the eternal Word of God. Okay, thank you for listening and we'll do one more video.